Okay, so, um, so Jens already presented some, uh, some of what we have been doing yesterday. Uh, and I tried to, like, uh, went for like, a, a bit more bold statements, like with the title. That uh, in the end, what uh, we want to do in the Aquila Consortium is basically try to take all the data sets possible and available and try to make an inference out of it. And um, so I will try to show, like, showcase a few things that, uh, well, focus on two things and showcase uh, on some others and why we are aiming into this and see uh, if that uh, things are actually working. Uh, so we'll go first for a small uh, introduction and a reminder for uh, yesterday's talks and uh, the overall framework in which, in, uh, which we are working, actually. And uh, then we'll uh, focus on two specific models that uh, so that have uh, been developed uh, very recently. So the Altai model that I will uh, discuss in more details and the uh, velocity uh, flow model that I will uh, also discuss. And then uh, like a more uh, forward view on uh, different uh, effects and, uh, and uh, data sets that you want to analyze. So first, uh, what's the framework? What's, uh, what was the actual uh, starting point of this? So the idea is that um, generally when we are like fear additions and uh, we have a model and we like to make models that are very precise and, uh, and we always like claim, well, we basically have to assume that they are perfect most of the time and we have to do this when you do fitting. And uh, on the other hand, you have like observations that are great but messy because uh, of the different limitations of instrumentations and uh, because that we don't control everything on the pipeline and everything. And uh, so observers do their best, but we still end up having to interpret this data in, with the best that we can. And uh, basically, it ends up like we have to do various hacking on both model and observations to try to make sense. So the question is that can we automate all this and actually make a machine that does a job for us and then we can retire and uh, sleep and uh, just let the machine do and we do physics and live happily ever after. So, um, so that was the uh, background basically. And um, so of course the ideal scheme would be the following. So then we have like cosmology, we are happy, we have like a theory that produces initial conditions. And uh, these initial conditions, then it goes to a great simulator. So I, because we are in France, I say that's Ramses. So there would be a super Ramses that does everything. Uh, then uh, it generates like this wonderful uh, hyper horizon simulation with all the details down to like uh, nuclear physics and everything, maybe quarks, who knows. And, uh, and then it's observed uh, by uh, like a powerful like virtual nuclear telescopes in the machine. And then you can compare this to observations. Of course, that's completely dream and not possible because otherwise we have a full universe in the computer and that's not feasible. So um, in practice, that's what happens. So we have initial conditions, so far so good. We have like a well, approximate and body solver. We have some black magic, like uh, different screws that are working to try to actually map to this data set. But the, uh, the idea is that can we make this completely automated so that uh, we managed to do like good inference on this part. Uh, so that's why uh, we built the, uh, the Borg cube. So that's uh, the Borg. And that was the actual idea also, the idea is that uh, you cannot resist, you will be assimilated anyway. <laughs> so that was the motto be actually behind the movie. So, and um, so nowadays, so just to give you an idea, so the uh, Borg software is growing and it's uh, nearly uh, approaching 46,000 lines of codes and parallelization and everything. So it starts being a major beast. And uh, the reason is because there are many um, uh, phenomenology implemented in it. So to go back to the, uh, to the foundation, so, we, uh, so the Borg inference framework is based on uh, the idea that we have a good idea of, that, of the initial conditions. They are fairly uh, Gaussian. And we start from this prior, so uh, quietus in case of uh, missing data. And uh, from this uh, initial conditions, we push uh, with uh, uh, for one model that will give us the total evolved matter density for this uh, for one model that would be like n body solver, for example. And uh, then we continue pushing different things. So to uh, highlight these problems between the uh, matter field and the uh, galaxy distribution, we have like an effective bias model uh, that I will sh discuss a little bit later. 
Uh, then, uh, of course, this, uh, this galaxy is here. It's not the one that you observe, so they are selected, so they are instrumental effects. So this approach at the moment is uh, only a frequentist estimate, so we only uh, observe a fraction of these galaxies. And, um, of course, that has to be improved at some point. Uh, and, of course, then you uh, compare this uh, ops, well, mock observed distribution of galaxies to the actual observed galaxies through a, a metric that will be a likelihood that is a Poisson or negative binomials or whatever is your preferred, uh, 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 preferred model. Of course, for this to work, so as Jens was mentioning yesterday, so we rely on the Hamiltonian Markov chain uh, algorithm, uh, mostly, uh, for doing the, the, uh, the, uh, the major part of the job. And for this, we need the forward model and the adjoint model. So we have a differentiability of all these operations for all the models that we implemented. So the, uh, and, uh, but all these pieces are easily exchangeable in practice in the, uh, in the implementation. So you can choose another bias model, another forward model, all those kind of selections, all the likelihoods, it doesn't matter. Uh, and in practice, there are also like other additional effects that we implemented, like the, for the foregrounds that we modify this guy so that we have additional parameters for, uh, seeing if they have like uh, imprecisions and systematic effects in this selection function that you can model. Uh, so I was mentioning the bias model here. Uh, of course, we went uh, further than just a linear bias model. Uh, so that was the basic uh, assumption here, but it's not working in practice for this kind of uh, precision that we're aiming for. Uh, and uh, so we implemented the li library of models. So starting from the linear one, the power law bias model, which was in uh, the Borg 2 original paper, then the double power law, the one point uh, halo empirical, uh, uh, one point halo, yeah, empirical halo model, uh, which basically is a power law model with an equation that was uh, suggested by the uh, work of Mark Nairink on simulations. Uh, so we are working also on um, a full uh, one point halo uh, distribution that would be, uh, so that would express what's the uh, joint uh, distribution for different masses. Uh, and we have also non-local models because of course uh, we are, don't have like a full description. So it's a bit like what Shirley was explaining yesterday about the two LPT and that we are, so uh, then you can increase a little bit the model to have like a full uh, dark matter distribution from just a two LPT model. So then we can have uh, also other like a kind of uh, uh, bias model that can actually bring you directly there uh, from an approximate uh, for one model. So that's uh, EFT typically, so an EFT kind of model, single order bias model that was that's discussed actually by Fabian Schmidt. And the uh, Octree model, that's uh, his uh, kind of idea to try to build a like, uh, hierarchical representation of the, uh, uh, of the density field and see if like, you can fit directly all these parameters, a bit like a neural network in some way, to uh, the ops of galaxy distribution. So that's a kind of library that exists and it's non-exhaustive and that we try all these models. Uh, so uh, Jens uh, showed some uh, very cool applications uh, yesterday on the 2M++ uh, and SDSS. Uh, so I will not go back to them, uh, but I will show like what we are doing now on the, the uh, extensions of these models with the uh, expand, notably for fitting the cosmic expansion. So um, when you observe uh, surveys, of course, you're seeing things on the Lycon, on your Lycon. And uh, that's typically the case for SDSS3. Uh, and uh, you're sitting here and you're seeing the universe starting from here at different epochs and with only spectroscopic data to guard you. So of course, uh, uh, you, you, know, you don't see the galaxy that, are, well, the structure forming at the same epochs and you see things only through the uh, redshift metric. Uh, of course, uh, that would be nice to optimally use all this data that uh, like give you actually cosmological information because, uh, because of the redshift distortion, you only see like structures that are, well, that would be spherical that appears like elongated on the line of sight. So for example, these voids here would, instead of being like in average round, would be like distorted. And that's true for all large scale structures at all scales. Uh, so, so far we've been like trying to like grasp like a different part of this data set, but we wanted to see if it's possible to actually use everything that is available in the data. 
so there are two pieces, those are Lycon, so there is the cosmic expansion that I just mentioned. So uh, that's uh, uh, a simulation of what you could see if you like bin uh, redshift, uh, well, the galaxy uh, distribution in redshift. And so you have this kind of uh, the, uh, dilution of the distribution. And of course, you have the look back time also, that's uh, the growth of structures. So you see that start from initial conditions to this kind of uh, large scale structures. So there are two effects. So there is the, uh, the first effect is the, uh, it's been implemented as part of what's called the Altair model. So that's uh, implemented by Dugesh, who is in the back over there. Uh, and uh, the idea is to add another layer in this uh, chain here, where you put actually the cosmic expansion at the same time. And uh, that's interesting because uh, if you like uh, fit to data, that gives you two feedback on the uh, cosmology test if you bar the initial conditions. So it's both in the dynamical model and on the cosmic expansion. Here. And of course, you co we continue marginalizing over the bias transformation and all the density field. Uh, in practice, there are a few, uh, a few details that are a bit uh, uh, that you have to take care of. So the first uh, big detail is that uh, you have, of course, you have to resample uh, grids on grids, and if you do it badly, then uh, you end up with artifacts. Uh, so here, so you, have, uh, you start from a density that is co-moving, and you project to a redshift, and you want to know what's the transformation between the two. So instead of relying on directly particles, we do it on grid on grid, and in practice, we do it like with uh, fifth order uh, interpolation. Uh, 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 with, a, with fifth order linear in density and nonlinear in uh, coordinates uh, from like density in co-moving to density in redshift. And uh, if you uh, leave the uh, cosmology like floating, uh, so this is an example here between omega matter and uh, W, uh, W naught for uh, dark energy, then uh, you see this kind of, uh, for fixed uh, large scale structures, uh, you see this kind of uh, effect in redshift. So you can see that it affects both the central part that is concentrated or not, and then, of course, the global distortions. So that's what we are trying to anchor up by just observing data. The second effect is the, uh, the Lycon effect, of course. Uh, at the, uh, so at the, we implemented it at the level of LPT and 2LPT at the moment, and uh, by making an uh, approximation that uh, actually, when you see, uh, so the growth that is indicated by a given point in space is given by the uh, corresponding Lagrangian coordinates and not by the Eulerian coordinates. So that's fine uh, at the level that we're considering, but of course there are some higher order effects that we neglect and that, has, that can be implemented in practice given more sweat. Uh, but the advantage is that it's differentiable and uh, it also can be generalized to a particle mesh code if you need it. Okay, so we tried this, uh, this game on a mock dataset on a mock dataset that looks like SDSS3. So the SDSS3 has this completed structure already. So this is the Lozy sample and the uh, CMA sample. And um, with this kind of uh, radial selection function. And uh, so we try to push this in, uh, uh, well, in the forward model and try to refit the uh, cosmological parameters that correspond to this, so notably omega matter and W. Uh, so that's what came out of the likelihood. So when we malignize over the, uh, uh, the biases and uh, all the different like density that is possible, so all the other parameters that includes the, including the model. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, even if you, um, uh, if you don't put like anything uh, like particular, of course, you have to assume a prior, but I will come back to this later. So you still get uh, like very tight constraints on omega matter. So even if you marginalize on all, according to all densities and all bias parameters, etc., uh, which means that there is a large treasure trove of data that is still available in, in practice. And even if you start like, I mean, compared to BO, so even if you start like throwing away tons of data, then you still have like a large amount uh, that you can tap in if you need it. Um, and uh, in this, so we try that actually for at the level of SDSS3 that we are, at the level of the SDSS3 data that we are looking in. So most of the information comes actually from the cosmic expansion and not so much from the Lycon part. 
Um, so there was another point of view that we noticed that's uh, come from uh, Lietel that is in 2014-2016 that uh, relied on the gradient uh, description of the density and that also managed to see that uh, we, um, we have also a large structure of data that is available if necessary. So there, this is another nice uh, paper about this problem. So, of course, we looked at uh, the resiliency of this result because we can fit it and say, okay, maybe we got lucky, maybe uh, actually it's highly degenerate with other things. Uh, but the first thing that we can see is that if you build the covariance matrices of these two parameters uh, for the chain here, so these two parameters that is omega matter and W naught, compared to all the other bias parameters that are entering in the, in the model, so there are four catalogs in practice that are completely independent, and uh, with uh, four uh, uh, bias parameters for each catalog, then, uh, well, it's pretty much decorrelated here. So it's close to zero. Even though, like in the bias parameters themselves, have very complicated structures in covariance matrices. Um, the second aspect that we say, okay, maybe uh, we are going to be sensitive to the prior. So let's try to shake the prior quite uh, a bit more brutally. So. Previously, we had this result. If we assume that the good prior is the same prior that we use for generating the mock data, and of course, uh, you can well, you can change this to a bad prior, uh, like we take omega matter equal 0.4, for example, for the uh, power spectrum, and try to see if we, when we fit it, if we recover the same cosmology. And it happens that uh, yes, up to like a slight expansion of uh, the error bar on omega matter, then mostly like doesn't affect anything. So it means that most of the information comes really from, ex uh, from the uh, geometry. And, uh, that is in and basically, once you fit it like the density field that's, uh, that is driven by data, then it doesn't care. So it just captures the geometry, try to make it the best uh, isotropic possible, and then it finds the correct parameters. So that's fairly uh, reassuring. Uh, in terms of MCMC efficiency, because we, are, we were chat discussing about that yesterday, so this, even if you put all this uh, together, then uh, the decorrelation on, uh, uh, for this one is the for omega matter or W naught, I don't remember, parameter, then uh, the decorrelation is happening in like 50 uh, time steps, uh, 50 MCMC steps of the chain. So that's fairly like uh, also fast to realize for this kind of data set. So that's great. Uh, so we have, uh, so we're showing like an, another extension here of the bog machine. And uh, so we're trying to, so it's starting to be really like something that you can nearly directly uh, apply to data sets and be fairly uh, uh, confident in the result. And uh, the ulterior extension is uh, showing promising uh, like future for trying to measure directly uh, cosmological parameters from uh, data from this data set. And, uh, we are contemplating applications directly to data in the very near future. So please check on Dugge's work on our in practice. Um, so the second uh, part uh, of this presentation was uh, about also extension that uh, on other data sets like distance data. Uh, and uh, some application to data of this method. So it was actually a uh, like another motivation that I had from a long time ago. So it starts, well, velocity field, I started this doing my PhD, basically. And uh, so it's, uh, so the interesting aspect of velocity field is that basically it's, uh, it's a bit like uh, uh, lensing, ISW. Uh, uh, it gives like a, a more direct point of view on the, uh, on the gravity field on large scales, except that they're available locally. You don't need like a, a background source and it's very high signal to noise locally, so which is good and bad at the same time. Uh, but it's very noisy at large distance, which actually is quite bad to handle. So there are different uh, good and bad aspects to the distance data. But it's, uh, we, have, we have them, so we should be using them. And it's uh, particularly interesting because also in the future, uh, we'll be contemplating also large data set that looks like distance data, like supernova samples. So in the context of LSST, so we have like maybe, uh, I think, like 100,000 of supernovas or more. And, uh, and we are actually new, uh, new surveys like Taipan or Zwicky Transit Factory that are already producing all these events. So we'll be, we should be using them now also and try to, anch to help anchoring all these other parameters. Um, and so of course, it's, an old, uh, it's not a new idea. It dates from like 1970s at minimum. Uh, 
uh, with Jim Peebles uh, working on the action method, notably. So the problem is the following. So you have a set of noisy distance data, and uh, you have a spectroscopic data at the same time, so you would like to mix them together in some way and get a total matter map out of this, and the cosmological parameters at the same time. The usual challenge. Um, so the first uh, model that uh, was coming up was the Verbius model. So the Verbius model tried to encode all the problems that we know were occurring in data. Uh, so first we have a di we rely on a distance estimate that is mostly uh, uh, log normal, basically. Uh, so we have spectral measurements with velocity field that uh, have like uncertain, uncertain characterization on, the, uh, on both the model side and on the data side. Uh, we have uh, some cosmology, of course, that enter into this problem. And uh, of course, because uh, we are uncertain on the model, we are not sure, but depending on the types of galaxies, if we are start missing like a uh, nonlinear part of the flows, or like if we are fine and we are, we are cool, uh, we are on the cool part of the flow. So, it's, so we have to basically uh, distinguish between two types of galaxies. So the one that are more like uh, in, the, uh, in the field, so like uh, spiral galaxies, and the one that are living, like that, the red galaxies that are more living in the central part of the uh, of the of the clusters, and that that one may have like larger velocity dispersion. So it's a it's a model that already had, like many uh, other also like um, gears like working a bit differently. Um, so it's uh, so we re-implemented this. Uh, so there was a Verbius one, and then now we are working on Verbius two for a reason that's uh, going to be quickly uh, clear. Uh, and this Verbius 2, so that's work on Florian, so he's here in the back. Uh, as uh, many, uh, I, it's like a bit, like a spasta <laughs> source, <laughs> because it has like a, a cosmology that enters here, so you have observed distance indicators, so you have to have these unknown uh, galaxies, whether they are like uh, good tracers or bad tracers, that, uh, and you're unsure about their characterization. Uh, you have observed redshifts, and you try to mix this data together in different bits. So the galaxy typing is going to affect the noise estimate. The observed redshifts, of course, have other trouble because uh, you have the systematic effect in the, uh, that happens from the selections in redshifts that modify, and that means that you don't, we are not sure about which redshift is the correct one. Uh, you have non unknowns for the uh, usual uh, Rumsfeld, uh, Shirley uh, characterization of noise. Uh, and uh, you have a uh, velocity field that goes here and talks to this noise estimate to predict distances and gives cosmological refresh that feedbacks on velocity field. So it's uh, so you have to clear out all this mess, but of course you can write everything in Bayesian hierarchical fashion, and uh, it happens to work in practice. Uh, of course, as we are working with Borg now, so instead of having a simple uh, model that goes from here to here. We're going to work in the very near future to uh, actually use a full uh, nonlinear velocity field uh, description for the inference in this uh, wall machine. So I was mentioning that uh, the uh, the uh, well one of the uh, one of the ad uh, additions of this uh, new uh, model that is in uh, Verbius two actually is the uh, characterization of this systematic effect that is here, and that's a fairly uh, important effect when you work with uh, new surveys. Uh, it comes from the fact that it's um, uh, difficult to characterize systematic effect in distance in the distance part of distance data, but it's uh, easy to characterize them in the spectroscopic part. So if you have, like, for example, uh, line width uh, and you well, uh, line width velocity dispersion, and you want to and you apply a cut, that's very bad because you're not sure about what's happening on this set of the telescopes. But if you have spectroscopic data and you say that oh, I'm going to cut in the redshift, then that's fairly clean and you know what's happening. Uh, of course, you have to uh, be aware that when you do this, uh, then of course you're going to observe only uh, the red points here inside the circle, except that uh, they may be coming from some other place outside and being scattered inside randomly. Um, and uh, that means that in practice, if you don't correct for this effect at the edges of the survey, then suddenly you start having like strong inflow or outflows depending on the particular galaxy distribution. And that's, uh, uh, that deforms entirely your velocity field. So, um, so in practice, you have to correct for that. Uh, so that's uh, instead of having your red points here, they actually uh, you have to be aware that they are scattered around here. And that's what happens. So you can compute. That's fairly uh, easy. That's a few lines. 
of statistics. And uh, you manage to see that actually for galaxies that are close to the cut, indeed, they can be coming from very far away inside the catalog. So you have to be careful about that. So that's a case typically for the 6DF data. So if you, uh, 6DF data is uh, not, not dates like uh, from a few, uh, few years ago, so like five years ago now, it's five, six years ago. And, uh, and it has this kind of uh, selection here in redshift and see that it's abruptly cut and that creates this kind of trouble. Uh, whereas in distance that it's very smooth and uh, there is nothing clearly apparent. And to give you an idea of the challenges that here is, uh, so you have in red, so you have redshift the galaxies, and the blue is their estimated distances. So it's a total mess. You don't see much of the structure there. And the idea is to make sense of it. So, so we implemented everything. So Florian has been uh, hard at work and testing that everything is working correctly. And that's some results on mock data. Uh, it's not, uh, so there are still a couple of things that uh, needs to be a handle for testing on 6DF data. But basically, uh, uh, we managed to recover like a mean radial flows for the mock 6DF data with some standard deviations and managed to do tomography of the density field in that sense. Also on the MCMC efficiency, we get, managed to get the decorrelation that is more in the order of like 100, 200, well, like 500 or so, or so uh, for, the, um, for the meta parameters, so for the summary statistics of uh, sigma NL in that case, and the type probabilities of assignment of a galaxy to a given sigma NL. Um, so we can, I cannot show you the application to via, with Vibius 2 yet, but I can show you an earlier application that was done with the uh, previous model on data. So that's the, uh, the Vibius 1 application on the uh, Cosmic Flows free data. So the uh, CF free data is, uh, is a composite, it's an assembly of different surveys also. That's made by Brent Sully and Hélène Courtois. Uh, that's made of uh, 6DS, Spitzer, Telefisher, Telefisher Recibo, some other Telefisher distances that comes from various sources. You have also a tip of the red giant branches, uh, uh, basically maser observations. Well, it's really an assembly of different surveys. So it's a, a practice, it's a real mess. <laughs> so, so if you want to model all this. Uh, and that's a different uh, distance distribution. And you see that 6DF composed the bulk of this, uh, uh, of this survey here. Uh, and that's the effect that you can see. So the, uh, for 6DF, so the original uh, um, uh, observed distribution of uh, distances like this, but when you start reconstructing these distances, that looks more like this. And for Spitzer, that's fairly fine, but, uh, and Terifsha Recibo is also fairly fine because it's uh, quite more compact and cut uh, in, um, in apparent uh, luminosity. So we, uh, we tried to do a different thing, so like uh, checking the uh, calibration of these tracers because that's related to the uh, Hubble constant problems. Yeah, um, that's related to a Hubble constant problem. And um, so in that case, so you can leave it this free as another additional parameters for, the, uh, uh, for living like the catalog breeze basically. And uh, that gives this kind of uh, distribution for the effective Hubble constant, uh, normalizing units of the calibration. So that's, uh, so one is the reference calibration and that's what is recovered by the, uh, by the model. So it looks like, um, I mean, fine, at least from the data, from the data point of view and the Verbius one point of view. Of course, we have this, all these maps that I showed previously here. So where is this map? Yeah, so that's the inferred density map here uh, with the intergalactic coordinates and where you actually see the usual structure of the universe with uh, Shapley concentration that is here. So here there is a suspicious filament uh, just next to the boundaries that's related to the problem that I was mentioning previously. But the, uh, but the other structures are essentially present at their right position. So of course we have a characterization also of the, uh, of the errors on, de on density and the error on the velocity, on the inferred velocity, so the total, uh, total components. 3D components in that case. And, uh, and basically that, uh, that works already quite nicely. So it's, uh, there are still a few catches, like I mentioned. Uh, and uh, now we are trying to try all, so that's why that was the point of developing the Verbius 2 model is to uh, enclose now the Borg model and predict like really uh, at smaller scales and try to handle uh, all the uh, mass distributions around our, 
uh, in our local patch of universe. So um, I will um, showcase now just a, f a few more applications and uh, where we're aiming for now. Uh, so the, uh, of course, so as a reminder, so we are the Aquila Consortium, so we have a nice website now, so please check it. <laughs> and, uh, and there are other applications to, um, to the boxing. So the, um, yesterday, so Jens flipped through the slides, but that's one of the applications that uh, is to improve of course, the velocity model of the local universe. So that's an application, direct applications for uh, gravitational wave characterization, uh, Hubble constants, and um, just uh, in general, when you have like a galaxy observations and you want to fit to correct for uh, like its local flows because you don't have distances. So that's, uh, that's pretty useful. So historically, that was the PSCZ model that was used. Uh, and I think that was used for the uh, shoes uh, paper originally. Uh, that was used for checking that the velocity flows are correct. So that's the quality of the velocity flow that were in this model. In uh, the 2M++ uh, original uh, caricature uh, model that was just a linear, model, a linear modeling of uh, velocity flows uh, and calibration to distance data. So that's the uh, kind of, uh, so I think that's the flows, the flows are up there and the density that is up there, uh, that is down there. Um, and now with the Borg model, we managed to do this kind of thing. So that's a much more physical uh, velocity flows and density uh, description of the surveys. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, checking and cross-checking all these uh, uh, actual models to see if they are consistent with each other and to what point uh, uh, they are breaking, etc. The um, other very nice application is uh, Harry, which is in the back here. Uh, that's, uh, it's uh, trying to do this, uh, this work on uh, constraining uh, fifth force gravity using Borg. Uh, so in that case, so, the, uh, so, so fifth force gravity basically acts, uh, uh, you can correct me if you, if you need. <laughs> it acts on the, uh, basically in practice on, uh, this, on uh, separating the effective centroid on the, uh, uh, of the gas halo distribution around the galaxy and its optical center. And uh, this uh, shift is in practice, uh, uh, the observed shift is in practice related to delta G over G. But for predicting this precise shift, you need the uh, gravitational map that is inferred by Borg in practice. And uh, he managed to get like very nice constraints and tight constraints on delta G over G uh, 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 on the scale of, uh, on the Compton scale of a 110 megaparsec, uh, which was not done before. Uh, the uh, other application is for like prediction of comma, uh, well, dynamics of clusters. So that's uh, the example of the mass distribution, but of course you can do uh, detailed re-simulations of the comma cluster. That's what we try to do, it's still not published. Uh, and uh, that's uh, five uh, realization of uh, the um, comma cluster, and uh, we, where we try to get 250 million particles to get like very detailed dynamics and try to assess the viability of, this, uh, of the formation of this cluster. And we see that typically, for example, they are always like present like a large, um, uh, there is a big merger generally, a, a late uh, big merger that occurs at the late, in late time here. Okay, so we, uh, we think that uh, there is, uh, well, a lot of potentiality in all these uh, applications and the different data set to which we can apply it. So we, uh, we showed like 2M++, and we tried to, now we are reaching a little bit the end of it. So we are moving to our DSS, uh, merging cosmic flows data, uh, eventually LSST when uh, supernovae data will become available and typically. And uh, try to put this into this uh, big machine that we are building. So uh, basically, both do this uh, cosmological assessment, like uh, from uh, so for cosmological parameters measurements. But of course, to also reach uh, this other part that uh, is um, difficult to do uh, directly from in the machine. So we, when we fold like hydro, uh, for example, the effects, then uh, and uh, to predict like uh, x clay cluster emissions, KZ, uh, Rishama, or maybe dark matter in direct detections, etc. Of course, you can do also all that kind of uh, nice tests with uh, once you have the initial conditions. So you can assess the Gaussianity, uh, do like a cosmological parameter test on power spectrum, etc. So of course, in all this, the big problem is still um, so the 
the thing that I was mentioning at the beginning. So we need like a good uh, uh, tool works and uh, for mapping the dark matter distribution to observations of galaxies. And uh, that's still uh, ongoing research on how to do this the most efficiently possible. And uh, we, without losing the less amount of data, but still sufficiently flexible that we don't care about the details of galaxies. And that's uh, what we are trying to do also. So thank you very much. If you have questions.